Pardon? No, yeah. yeah. Okay, this is not the first. Yeah. Okay. So you see Melissa doing. Um, first of all, this is James Conway, the guy I admire from the very first time I saw his uh, Facebook page, from the very first video, and I'm very hard to please. Very hard to please. So I um, love what James is doing, what he's about, what he says, his honesty. And um, I hope he gets in. We need to get him in. So James, you saw my leaflet at the last time we met at Shannon's site, and I loved your interview on Shannon's site. I loved what you said at the end. It's fantastic about the cronies. Mm. It's very, very Managed good. Managed to be cut out of uh, Shannon's site's clip that they put they up. They put it well. back in today. Oh, did they put it back? back. Oh, wonderful. Back. That's good. a good thing. Very I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. So um, I had seven points here, and I'm just wondering, like nobody, I've been all around the country, nobody knows what 5G is. Our councillors at the council said they haven't a clue. They yeah. actually said we haven't a clue, we're making decisions, we're rolling out digital strategies for the county. Nobody knows what it is. Decisions are being made and I get people from England as well approaching their councils and they ask freedom of information, what is rolling out is 5G. Even those councils in another country, they don't know what 5G is. Yeah. So, and yet a decision was made that we're all going to have it. So when you see things like LED street lights, um, have you heard have you heard anything about them? I mean, it seems to be a, a solution for climate, but I'm getting people saying they can't sleep anymore in their own state. Yeah. You know. Well, I think it it all goes back to how governments have always behaved. They're very quick to jump on the next bandwagon. So if you go back to medicine in the early 1900s, you will see that an awful lot of medicine actually contained cocaine, heroin, things like this. So governments have a tendency to move forward on the first band of scientific research but they don't drill into it into side effects things like this and then move forward on it which is the major problem with 5g i think there's very little in the line of actual people in political power who know about it and know mm. about the dangers of it and yet they've gone ahead i think they have gone ahead but as i discussed with you yesterday it seems to be an easier infrastructural project than to actually do everything underground and i think that's why the movement it's like a miracle cure for politicians and governments who are not good at infrastructural projects. They're not worrying about the side effects or the, the long-term diseases out of it, what they are. They have an electorate who wants broadband. They want internet connectivity. In a country like we have here in Ireland, where we have marble, quartz, granite, that makes underground cabling difficult, they're willing to actually skip ahead of the problems with it just to get that service to please the people. And from what I've looked into since I met yourself, it's lethal. Uh, and we really do need to look into it. But getting back to the alternative again, what is the alternative? Because but then you're back to what is it they're giving us? Because yes. it's not actually broadband at all. Like I put up on my Facebook today, like the, the host of the radio show yesterday thought, Connectivity is broadband, you know, what are you on about? Uh, they're actually having smart diapers, that's smart nappies, yeah. so that the nappies now will send a signal to the parents to tell them they're full. Yeah. Now that's a signal that goes to a, a mast. That mast is on somebody's doorstep, like an NS Chrome, they don't want it. Yeah. People within a two to three kilometre radius of mast have been known for decades. Well, to see, I think the, uh, the, ultimate, the ultimate goal is total connectivity, of which is coming. Yeah, which is coming. One, two, one, two. So, we, we could have a situation yet where we have a milk bottle that informs the fridge that, that is it's nearly out of milk. That's, which that's is almost an old-fashioned idea yeah, that got so far ahead. But it's a ridiculous concept. And then we also, you see, where does it stop? This is my major worry. Does because it? it seems to me that we're coming to a day where we almost want to augment ourselves into a connected basis. So we uh, have that is actually Elon Musk's yeah, Neuralink. Yeah, well that's what I'm saying. But <laughs> that's what it is, yeah. The trouble with that is the brain is still one of the most powerful computers in the world. Mm. Now, if you have something that's inserted into and they're actually doing it in America already, they're putting chips into their hands and using them as security chips and telling people that you can pay at the counter and all this, and no one's batting an eyelid at it. Mm -hmm. But that goes from the hand and then it'll go eventually into the brain and eventually into the eye. My worry is we have phones, we have smart watches, we have smart glasses coming now. All these are to get you used to the idea of augmenting technology into your day-to-day -day life, which is a very dangerous thing. Because if a computer can get a virus, then eventually an augmented human can get a virus. And then we have... You're thinking way ahead there, James. Well, you see, it's all a goal, in my mind, uh, it's, uh, it's a goal of depopulation.
and I certainly do believe that an augmented human race, the technology is augmented into their day-to-day -day lives, it, it leaves an entity where outside forces could certainly do quite a lot of damage. Like they've admitted that. Yeah, but they have admitted it. Everyone is worried about Russia and America with nuclear bombs. But what the real worry should be is, in the future, wars won't be fought with bombs or anything. It could be fought by shutting down a country's system. So they're afraid of that with the Hawaii. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yes, we we found out that they are covered as well. If you look at America at the moment, 70% of America's electrical infrastructure is ran on Windows 98. So okay. Windows 98 isn't a very difficult system to hack. So truthfully, Russia doesn't really need to blow up America. Russia could shut down America's electrical system in approximately eight hours. We're at the point now where Russia is actually laughing, saying that America is going to themselves where they're going with the technology they just have to yeah. stop that because yeah. the Russians are way ahead of us. Well you see you have to look into it as well the Russians are actually talking about what we're talking about and avoid a because lot of these aspects. They know things the yeah because even uh, there's one the nuclear missiles that Russia has they have avoided using modern technology because they felt that it left too much security sensitive mm -hmm. or sensitivity so they have nuclear bombs where you still have three men who have to turn the key before launch. America doesn't have that because America thinks the future is completely technologically based when in actual fact it's leading to weakness within their own country. It is, yeah. The smart major grid, for example, um, have you even been told that there's an OPSAT register for that? I have because I'll tell you. Oh, I, you hear that? When I heard it at work, I was actually putting in fiber oh, optic for a while. Now, here's a good one though. When they pull a fiber optic cable into your meter box, which is where your broadband is coming if you have silo broadband put in a room. One, two. That cable is actually drilled at the left hand bottom corner of your meter box for one sole purpose. It's to leave enough space here to further right that the smart meter can sit there underneath the existing wheel meter. Right. So they're already moving ahead that one, uh, the fibre optic coming in is being put in in such a way that the company is leaving room for their next project. Mm -hmm. And how do you feel about the fact that there's um, a known, there's an admission of harm in 2010 on shortages, and that every single country in the last 10 years that have had them rolled out have had very seriously ill people, a percentage of the population, and yet here we are in Ireland, yeah. our government is actually pushing them out. How do you feel about a government that would do that? Well, uh, or am I asking the right question? Disappointed but not surprised. Mm -hmm. The Ireland has always been very, very poor at taking on scientific and economic research that is fairly sound. It's always been the case. We have a tendency of always being one seven two, eight years two. behind the loop. We have a government that fears not being on the cutting edge of technology all the time because they really fear it, that it's the next step ahead all the time. And they're not confident in their own ability to look into these problems. So Do you think they're even interested? I mean, there's, there's people that are ill and they're just sort of denying that they're ill and they make an excuse. It's like being swept under the carpet. Yeah, well, as I said, getting back to the conspiracy thing, the government likes to point out that if you, want, if you worry about any of these things, you're a conspiracy theorist. But how about the people who are actually ill? Oh, it's terrible, but as I said, there is a mid an, an admission that it's, it is harming them. So therefore, the government should be... The utilities company admitted it in America that they know people have been harmed and they had a they had a discussion among themselves and those emails got leaked out as to what can we do about this problem. Well it's very much like the tobacco company. All right, yes. The tobacco companies knew for years before it uh -huh. came out mm -hmm. the harm that they were doing to the general public. Yeah. But getting back to it, you're dealing with a utilities company in Ireland that are massive parts of the economy. Now governments are afraid to take these entities on because they know without them their party is unfunded. They know without them, there are people who are going to have no services. So you have to realise it from both ends of the spectrum. I don't agree with it, mm -hmm. but I totally understand why it is going on. It's the stench. It's the stench of cronyism, okay. and it's been going on for a long, long time. How do you feel about the fact there's legislation to do with Wi-Fi, and our government is not even enforcing it? And the, the outcome of that means that the, government, the country's in a position now, I hear from the wireless expert who knows this, that anybody with um, ADHD, autism, in the last few years, or anybody who's died, with, uh, who's had a pacemaker, is in a position to potentially sue the government. 
And the same was, like, how do I say it? I know in the heart and soul from the research that I've looked at how dangerous it is. But how many people, when the labelling changed on the cigarette box and then they sued the country? They were addicted first, yeah. Yeah. So they've they done the same with phones. Did you know, like, you being a, a young person, all the young people I meet, they have their phone held up to their ear and it's for hours. Did you know that now they are putting a label on phones? Yeah, do not. It, the phone mm -hmm. was never intended to be used like that. It yeah. was intended for a short call every once, every two or three hours. But even their own testing, they never tested it here, they tested it here. Yeah, well, I, I've actually seen a wonderful thing where they put a, a steel wool with an electric charge around the phone and mm -hmm. got a phone call and because of the radiation <laughs> it just blew into flame. I don't think I don't think people realise the danger. And it that is phones like radiation. Yeah. It is, yeah. yeah. Well, the government is playing it down all the time, saying it's too weak to do any damage. But really, they're saying it's too weak to heat you up. Well, to burn you. <laughs> X-ray is another form of radiation. Now, I would argue, how is it that when you go for an X-ray, you see the lady doing the X-ray, she goes into a different room, she does everything properly, but then it's perfectly sound for her to come out and take a call for an hour or two hours. It's not being pointed out because. It's a worldwide, uh, it's, it's such a big amount of every country's economy, that what do you replace it with? Well, what's the cost? The cost of people. Oh, definitely. It definitely is. But the same could be said for the Industrial Revolution. Do you know when you had the coal mines and you had every plant and there was child labour and everything, what was the cost then? You don't have a very good argument to keep this. Well, no, I'm not. Not <laughs> at all. I'm just saying, historically, that they always did. They, they always, always did. They always we have this sort of illusion that they, they, they look after us, but they never do. No, and never have. Never have. And never it's, will. The, it's the same way. Unless we get you in. Well, I, even <laughs> I can get in and I can point it out in that. But what I am saying is historically, people always want the next step of development. So if you go back to the, the Roman times, you know, the roads, the roads had to be built. Mm -hmm. That was back breaking labour for the slaves. But no one was worried about that. Do you know what I mean? At every stage, the general populace of Rome weren't worried about these people breaking their backs to dig out stones and lay them straight in line. Then in the Industrial Revolution, people weren't worried that little children were going down in coal mines and canaries were dying and weren't getting out in time and they were being gassed out of it. So that's sort of, though, why we have a constitution with personal rights. It is, but we have a constitution that isn't easy. There was, a, there was a constitution in And yet England. they'll have a big referendum across the, the, the country of fortune to pretend it's been heated. You know what I mean? Yeah, but a referendum is simply the people who are in power kicking the bucket of blame back to the people instead of themselves. No, but they want to change something here or there. Let's have a referendum and give them the illusion that the it's whole a, country's it's an involved. It's an illusion of democracy. The whole country's involved, and then they make a big decision to have a wireless future where you're going to be get connected to the internet. And well, let's, the let's look at ourselves. They don't give you a vote. Let's look at ourselves. Yeah. We're standing for election here, all right? Mm -hmm. Every four years, every four to five years, depending on the country, you get 20 names in front of you, you tick a box. One, two, three, and four. You never see that person again for four or five years. Yeah. Is that democratic representation? Absolutely not. That system has to change. No, it has, it has to, change. to change. But uh, the only some way candidates now, and they're just <coughs> sitting as so they would, well, with their little daily updates on videos. And I know from looking at them, they've been in for years. You don't see them except when there's an election. Yeah. And there's one good one at the moment now. He's he's advertising. He's made access to cancer services better. But last year he was advertising 320 new masks. So if you have the mask, you need the cancer. Now he's providing the services for cancer. Yeah. Is anybody even following this? Well, you see, it is, it, it is a cycle. You see. Years ago, it's like, um, how would I say it? You know doctors recommending smoking? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right? They did, yeah. That was self-serving. Mm -hmm. It wasn't doctors smoke camels. It was doctors would prefer you to smoke because you're going to have a cough, you're going to have a cold, <laughs> at some stage you're going to have lung cancer and we'll all feel bad about you and we'll give you these painkillers and we'll charge your family for them. It's self-serving. Mm -hmm. So it's a cycle. It's not a cycle. Like, what a government should be coming out and saying is, look, the best way you could possibly live your life is try and be debt-free. Try to grow your own food that you know that everything you consume, you know exactly what has got into it. Try and get your own water supply, because then you will know where your water supply is, whether it's contaminated or not. So that doesn't suit you? No, it doesn't, because how do you tax that? You can't. Mm -hmm. You know, a government, a modern-day government is not there to serve you. A modern day government is there to enslave you. 
is to yeah. keep you in a, a circuit of consumerism and it's self-serving. It's like clothes, for instance. All right? We're given out in Ireland now about our carbon output and all that. Clothing is one of the worst mm -hmm. carbon criminals there is. But do you hear anyone saying, you know that shirt you have? Try and get four years out of it because that's probably put out as much as a quarter of your vehicle's uh, carbon output to make. You don't hear a politician saying that because what they want is to buy more shirts. Exactly. Because shirts is shops and money and factories and everything is good. So the question they keep asking the, the leaders who are carving up the country before they've even got in is do you think the country's in a better place now than it was no, five years ago? certainly not because we've had 2% inflation every year since the downturn. We've had absolutely no uh, monetary inflation. If anything, the euro has devalued to an extraordinary point. The euro, in my opinion, is on the brink of collapse. It's just a few outside entities who keep the show ticking over. But eventually, that show will end. Deutsche Bank, for instance, is the biggest bank in Europe and one of the biggest in the world. It's absolutely vital to the European Central Bank. Since the rumours came out of the job cuts last year, one billion per day has left Deutsche Bank. Now, that's not your average Joe taking out one billion. That's the professional investor. And our government is fully aware of it. Ireland is fully aware of it. Maybe they're not cognitive of how the system works, but they're aware of it. Right. So the ban is coming, and it's mm -hmm. coming very short. Yep. You're talking about emotion. It's excellent about um, how people are actually enslaved and don't realise it. Yes. You're also excellent on democracy. Yes. Well, I've, I've looked into them. I, 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 like the point I made about slavery is, if you look up any definition of slavery, it's, uh, it's a return system for work for labour, and you get shelter, water, and food. Now, I would argue that if you have a job in Ireland, and at the end of the week, you can afford your shelter, your food, and your water, you're still a slave. You haven't developed from it. You know, it's, it's still the same system with a different... Maybe the shelter looks a bit nicer. And maybe it doesn't. But maybe it doesn't, is right. And maybe way. you don't have it. Yes, there's an awful lot of have it. I would argue that in Ireland, when my grandfather was a young man, there was very few homeless people. Mm. You know, in the 1930s and 40s, there was uh, what was called the emergency. It, there was actually a wonderful story about a man. He was a glutton, which you don't hear about anymore. He had an eating disorder where he couldn't stop eating. And the whole parish knew he was a glutton. So he could go from one house to each house and everyone fed him. This is the truth. This went on. <laughs> because... If this was his problem. He couldn't stop eating. He physically couldn't. He had an eating disorder. Right, right. Now, there was, this was common talk in Ireland at the time. Every county had at least one. It was a mental health disorder. He could not stop eating. But he wasn't turned away and he didn't have to sleep out on the street. He went from his own house and he went from each neighbour to the next. Mm -hmm. And he ate. Mm -hmm. And people dealt with it. Well, now, my grandparents as well, they had better quality food. They had... 18 kids, they were poor, but they had better quality food. Yeah. They were never hungry. No. And they said that the, the country people had a network. If somebody killed an animal, they knew how to share it out. You exactly, know? yeah. And so if you people kill, were better off. Yeah, because if you killed a pig and you'd salt it and all that, and there was such a man down the road helped us at harvest time with the thrashing or that, and we better send him over something. That's it, it, was. it was a network of barter. It was. Now, I would argue at the moment there, I have a wallet there, you have a purse there. What do we have in it? Nothing. We have little pieces of paper that are only valuable because we all think they're valuable. There's no one, there's no network behind it. You have to look at how banking started. First system was barter. I have a chicken, you have a pile of logs. You want a chicken, I say, I like the look of your pile of logs. I want your pile of logs. You might say to me, well, I'll give you 13 of them. That was barter. We exchanged our goods for what we thought we had ourselves. Then someone came along with the idea of using gold and silver. This was a sound system. Gold and silver represented something that was rare, very hard to find, so therefore it might be worth three chickens or 43 logs. Then the bankers got a hold of it, and this is where it all started going wrong. You could deposit your gold or silver that you had for use at a later date, and they would provide a safe place for it, a place with security and walls, and it wasn't easy to rob and they would charge you a small percentage each year for doing that. But then they realised, not everyone is going to come for their silver and gold at the one time. So if I can lend to another person and I can charge them interest on it, then all of a sudden they realised, 
no one's coming at one time at all. I can start lending money that I don't have. All right, yeah, yeah. And that's where the trouble started. What do you think, or would you have a view on the fact that um, during the, or just when the councillors were voted in at the last local election, yeah. the CEO of the Common County Council borrowed 10 million? Mm -hmm. My first impression was that they learned nothing from 2008, you know? No, they haven't. Yeah. They haven't. You have to understand, nearly every major infrastructure project that the Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil have been engaged in since 2008 has had a cost overrun of between three to four times. Do you see any of them punished? There's no accountability. So how can you expect any? It's like a child. If a child keeps doing one behaviour all the time, you don't approve of it, but you never tell them, they're going to keep doing it. Yeah. That's how we treat government. Yeah, we treat yeah. them like spoiled children that we'll never give out to, or we'll never march to Dublin and take them out of office and say, so that's quite enough. Right now, we should be having a trial, not an election. <laughs> a trial? Yeah, for well, Agra. We should, oh, it's not just for Agra. A whole lot of them. Well, you would have to go back in this trial with most politicians who have been alive, and you would probably have to go back into the 30s. So you have to look at the essence of the trial then as well. The trial could cost how many billion? <laughs> so it would just have a price. Well, yes, it does have a price. I know that they have a way of slinging these things out. It wouldn't even be worth it. But at the same time... Well, it's super solicitor. In theory, in theory, it's what they should be doing. They should not be voting them back in again. No, because... So they won't put this up online, but at the same time... <laughs> yeah, they're not sure. But you, you see, it's... Um, it's reward for incompetence. That's what politics is in Ireland at the moment. The most incompetent are generally the most popular. So the person who doesn't really know what they're doing, everyone looks at them as if they're good looking and they have a way of carrying themselves. That's all it takes. They will be elected. 100 euros to become a councillor with a lot of smiles and looking good. And 500, 500 euros to get into the government. Yes. Yeah. Be the Taoiseach one day. Correct. And all the decisions that get made, ridiculous. I couldn't believe it if I saw how easy it was. Yeah, but it's a system. It's a self-serving system. The Greeks knew all about this. The Greeks didn't have political parties originally. Mm -hmm. And they had wrote it in to avoid them. Because predominantly you get three people. I say it all the time. You get the leader, the deputy leader, because he'll take over if the leader fakes up on someone. And the whip, the person who tells everyone, you're voting this way, you're thinking this way, you're acting this way. That's what you get, you get three. So in the confines, okay, of Dublin City, you'll have 45 TDs, okay? Just one city mm -hmm. of a nation. A lot of times there in the boom years and that, of that 45, maybe 20 would have been Fianna Fáil TDs. Of that 20 TDs, because the Taoiseach was generally a Dublin fella, you had one fella telling 19 people how to act and behave. <laughs> it's a self-serving system. The only way you can change it is to have viable independence. Oh, viable that. independence. Yeah. And then the system for running for election is set up in such a way that it's very hard for an independent to get out that they're viable. So we've had three weeks. And ridiculous. Yeah, we've had three weeks to get our things together and money together and get your printing done and get your face out there and organise people to... Mm -hmm. Set up to fail, and that shouldn't be allowed. But it is set How up. How do they get away? I think maybe because they're let away. There's no accountability. Well, we won't be letting them away anymore, James. Will we? No, but for win or lose, no. it stops now. No, it has to stop. But you see, for accountability, and I try drilling this into people all the time, to have accountability, you have to have men and women, um, men and women who are willing to hold people to account. Now, I have noticed for the first election in a while, Leo Varadkar on his journeys around has had people who have stopped and questioned him in the street and it's wonderful absolutely wonderful i remember being uh, probably 16 or 17 and Enda kenny was in our town and he had been on vincent brown the night before and vincent brown had given him a good grill and made a bit of a fool out of him and as our school bus passed him i let a roar out the window and i said vincent brown got you last night Enda. two hours later i was at my house and a neighbour called to my father in the house and told him that I was acting up in town. Oh my gosh, yeah. So, yeah. the first essence of rebellion, the first essence of holding someone to some sort of account, knocked that out of a child. So clearly now you were born for it. Yeah. For the government. Well, I don't know about... 
born, I would, certainly I'm not born for this government. I think it was in your blood, that's what I meant. It was, yeah. it was in your blood to know what sort of a leader should be run in this country. Yes, yeah. And what shouldn't, even as a school person, and most, when I was a school kid, I wasn't looking at the government, I tell you that much, didn't know what was going on. Well, you see, we were in a position, um, we had a farm, and both my parents were working extremely hard. Extremely hard. So both of them were holding down a full time job. They were sending me and my sister to school. They were doing everything correct. They didn't drink. They didn't smoke. They'd done everything. And they still had no money. And I thought, how on earth can this be a fair system where both my parents are doing everything that they're meant to do in the system and they still have no money? You know, you get, you get a, an essence every 10 years. They might have been able to afford the deposit for a new care. Mm -hmm. That's not financial soundness. Mm -hmm. So I did look into financial stuff after that, and I did realise there is a system for financial soundness, and that's uh, something I get in at a later stage with you, because there is a system why the wealthy people are wealthy and poor people are poor. Mm -hmm. And this banding that if you're poor, you haven't made the effort is ridiculous. Mm. If yeah. you're poor, you do not know the system that the wealthy people work on. Mm -hmm. If I can catch you very quickly now on democracy. Yeah. I thought what you said in Ballymore on democracy was just fantastic, you know. Yeah. Can you give us a little refresher? Well, what we have in Ireland isn't democracy. We have the facade of democracy. So, as I said, which political parties, you get the three. And it's generally the same. Just give it to me. You can edit it, I know. I can, yeah. yeah. Sorry. So, what we have in Ireland is the facade of democracy. We don't have democracy itself. So, when you vote for a political party, what, as I said, you get the three top guys, that's it. Now, nobody knows how they've been got to. Nobody knows how they're working in corporate interest. Or what we have in Ireland is corporocracy, not democracy. It's for the corporation. It's not, it's not about the people, it's about the top tiers of people. I tell you, we're getting close to it now, and our phone is going to be going off all the time. We leave it so. No, oh, we'll finish this. Well, yeah, you, you were very quick. You just gave a, a nice little thing on democracy um, at Ballymore. And the sound was just so bad. Yeah. I could, I could try to edit that. I could do. No, no, I'll do but it. But it would do you justice to get you a bit louder. Oh, we'll and do it. up close, because whoever had the phone was way down the back of the hall. Roshan was down in the back of the hall. He's up closer the next time we catch him. Well, we'll have a microphone here, which is an improvement. But democracy. We do not have democracy in Ireland. What we have is corporocracy. We have uh, outside interests who are banned to at all times. Because we have, in the region, of 14 to 20 men, and they are men mostly CEOs of multinational companies, and they account for approximately 40 to 43 percent of our tax intake. So we have a government that's terrified to ever stand up to these outside entities, because without them, the government is sunk. So democracy, we have a facade. What you need for true democracy is the entire parliament to be made up of independence, that you have valid argument, that if you bring forward legislation you have approximately 160 independent minds who are picking through every detail of that to see is it good policy. And not rushing it through on Christmas Day when they're all at home. No. no. That has to change, doesn't it? It does, but we have a president then, which is ridiculous. We, we elect a president every seven years, and people voted for, uh, as I said, uh, he's, he's the guard known to me because he's a lovely, pleasant man, but he doesn't do anything <laughs> apart from stand like this every so often. <laughs> His only <laughs> function, his only function, and he's long enough in politics to know his function. He's in politics forever. Yeah, he's yeah. in that politics, but he knows his function. His function is to drill into the minute detail of legislation. Not to visit the world. Not to visit the world. It's to drill into the minute detail of legislation. To have advisors to go over that legislation. And to block bad legislation. Now, how many bills have he blocked? Well, that's just not happening. In fact, I had no idea yeah. he was even supposed to do that because it's not happening. That's his function. <laughs> that's the, the I thought he was just signing something that had been agreed somewhere. No! He's signing it off. It's because he's supposed to have done some work. But when he's signing that on a Christmas day, how much work has he put into it? Three bills on Christmas. Three. 
So he didn't sit down and read the three days. No, because we see them standing with the two dogs like the Queen in front of the Christmas tree this year. Your, this is, it's the facade of political correctness. The person you want as a president is someone who is actually going to say no. No. And the president has the ability to dissolve Sorry. the doll. Mm-hmm. And they never do it. Mm-hmm. You know, we had a doll there coming up to Christmas that was in our health crisis. That was the time to say, look it, you've had long enough, this isn't happening. We need someone in there who knows what they're doing. Go back to the people, let the people decide. Well, but that didn't is. do it. When your time comes that you're in there making decisions, I hope you'll do what they never did, and that's find independent experts. Yes. Correct. Because they're well, out there and they will not listen to. They will well, not listen to in a car park street, wherever it is. They can't even. Because the money always takes the high road. You see, the president is the representation of the people. The one true representation of the people is what the president is meant to be. He's our one guy who represents us. We know the TDs and all that are got at and they're corrupted and all that. But we have another tier. In theory. In theory. But we also have a Senate that in theory they're should, doing should, should be doing a job. They're not now, absolutely not. Yeah, you think they'd know an independent expert. Obviously no. they wouldn't if it hit them between the years. Well, isn't it a good one? Isn't it a very good one? How we have a Senate. And if you go back uh, to Greek times and you talk about the Senate, to be, you have to be qualified at something. You have to be good at something. The Senate is it's like a nursing home for has beens. That's what it is. Right. So yeah. a political party will look at someone and say, he's not electable anymore. And throw it there. Yeah, they're supposed to have a degree or something, aren't they, to Shannon? Yeah. But the thing is, look who's given the degrees now, the tech industry. But this is like if me and you sat here for how many hours and everything we said was truthful, I guarantee you some university get onto us and say, well, let's make doctors out of them and give them some title behind their name. It's ridiculous. How many politicians do you see who are doctors of universities? They haven't done anything. They haven't done anything. It's a title and name only. But the world treats them as if they are something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why like, I, I, this form we're supposed to hand in for Shannon's side and the candidate profile about your parents. I haven't had it in and I won't hand it in to anyone. My candidate profile is here. Yes. Well, I'm going to, I was going to hand it in tonight, but the thing I was going to say about my parents was I'm, I'm proud that they have more degrees because I've half dozen. But I'm proud that they have no degrees because it taught me the value of common sense and wisdom. And you cannot get that in a, in a degree. No, and I'm I, saying that as somebody who has yeah. a bunch of degrees. Yeah, but you, you know, and I'm lucky that I wasn't brainwashed into thinking like everybody thinks this degree is something. Common sense and wisdom can't be bought, can't even be studied. No, but I'll tell you a good one. The leaving certificate, and we'll finish on this, the leaving certificate as an exam is not an exam on ability. It is an exam on your ability to be indoctrinated with useless information. And get more useless every day. So Correct. Yes. Yeah. Whatever the hell that does. So anyone, is. anyone who has any, uh, any get up and go in life and will do well in life, you won't find them at six hundred points. I can guarantee you that. 